Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Rainy Inverness, Advanced Higher Chemistry. We're going to have a good look today at empirical formula, or as the SQA refers to, elemental microanalysis, pages 100 to 101. This is my second time I did the first video on portrait mode. What a muppet. What is it for? How do we calculate them? And why do the SQA still use them? Goodness knows is the answer to the last one, considering that the technique was developed in the 18th century, as far as I can see. As far as I know, chemists today no longer use it, but it makes a nice, easy two or three mark calculation question for the SQA. Presumably, that's why they still do it. What does it tell us? An empirical formula tells you the simplest ratio of elements in an organic compound. For example, if you do the empirical formula calculation and you end up with C1H2O1, uh, that could be the formula, or it could be a multiple thereof of that. So it could be 2, 4, and 2. I suppose it could be 3, 6, and 3 as well. So just bear in mind that the empirical formula is the simplest one, not necessarily the actual one. You might need to multiply it up. It's a ratio of moles in the organic molecule. So how do we calculate it? Here's how we calculate it. For each element in your molecule, sorry about the red writing, uh, this was in my Mark 1 video. Um, so for each element, you divide the mass of the element by the GFM of the element. Do that for, there's usually like three different elements, a carbon, sulfur, and oxygen, or whatever. So do that for each of your elements, and you will probably get a horrible set of numbers. Um, how do we fix that particular problem? Well, we can do a maths thing. So if you have three horrible numbers, if you divide all of them by the smallest of these numbers, you can guarantee in making one of your numbers come to one. The others are probably going to be something like, say, 1.9, uh, say 3.1. It's okay to round if you're just above or just below the number. So this would be taken as 1 to 2 to 3. Um, however, you may find that once you've done your your uh, calculation, even after you divide it all by the smallest number, you might end up with this set of numbers, 1 to 1.5 to 2. You can't round from that, obviously, and you also can't have half a mole. So, um, or you can't have half an atom, rather. Um, so what do we do with this particular problem? We simply multiply up to get 2 to 3 to 4. Let's have a look at three examples now in order of increasing difficulty. Um, I was saying the last time around, I haven't seen a major calculation like this. Can we zoom in? Oh, thank you, Pixel. Excellent. I haven't seen a major calculation in a f good few years now. They have propped up, uh, they have cropped up, sorry, in the multiple choice. So let's take a look at this here for a second. The three questions I'm going to show you are quite good because they tackle three different ways of presenting the masses. Uh, in this particular one, they haven't given you a mass. They've actually, sorry, I scored out from the previous attempt. They were actually percentages. So I'm saying, nope, just score it out and replace it with grams. So now we have three masses. We can proceed with the calculation. 80 over 12 for carbon, 9.3 over 1, 10.7 over 16 gives you this. Now, this is quite nice because this is a classic example of a horrible ratio. Um, so how do we fix that? We're going to divide all of them by this guy here. Let me pick a different color. The colors are getting a bit confusing here. This is the smallest number, so I'm going to divide each of these numbers by that and see if that gives us a better ratio. No expense spared on this channel. An extremely complex and expensive calculator. Let me just do that for you. Okay, that's quite nice, actually, because it brings up what I was talking about earlier on. It comes out to be 10 to 13.9 to 1, which, of course, is 14. Don't know why I wrote that backwards there. So 10 to 14 to 1 is A. Let's move on. Question two. Is this question two? I'm going to zoom out for this one again, sorry. There we go. Actually, no, I'm not. Sorry, I used to be indecisive. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, this is... Okay, no, this is a relatively straightforward one again. This is, uh, I was thinking this was involving actual masses, but it's not. So I, I could, of course, pause the video and ask you to have a shot at this. Um, I'm going to pause my own video and do some sums in a very similar pattern to the last time around. Quite nice, this one, because it turns out this also demonstrates another concept I was talking about. We end up with, uh, put it on the screen, hey, that's better. We end up with 1.5 to 2 to 1, which, of course, you can have. Um, so let's multiply this up to be 3 to 4, to 2. 
So the empirical formula would be C3H4O2. Excellent. Uh, let's have a look at the last example. Is that on screen? Yep. Uh, this is a way that they used to, you can tell by the font. See the font here is from uh, olden times papers. And I'm glad I found this one because this one is the other method if they're looking to make your life slightly more difficult here. They're telling you that X contains one pen at a time, hey? Carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur. And if you burn X, then you get 3.52 grams of carbon dioxide, it's 2.16 grams of water, and 2.56 grams of sulfur dioxide. So uh, they actually give you the empirical formula here, and they're asking you to prove that that is correct. Now, in this case, um, what you do is instead of dividing your mass by the GFM of the element, you divide it by the mass of the GFM of the whole compound. So in our case, do we have any area I can do this working on? Let's do it in the box here. So 3.52 over 44 for carbon dioxide. That's your um, carbon. And I'm going to leave the hydrogen just now and I'm going to look at the sulfur dioxide. That's 2.56 over sulfur is 32 plus 264. Um, what do we do with the hydrogen? Because the formula of water is H2O, that means, this is the sneaky part, because for every one molecule of water that you made after, burn, after combustion, you must have used up two atoms of hydrogen, which means that we need to take the mass of the water, 2.16, divided by the 18, which is the GFM of the water, but that restores the correct number of hydrogen atoms that would have been in our original formula. Let me just do these sums for you. Okay, in orange here, guys, we've got the final answers. Um, so there are two carbons, there are six, uh, it's not hydrogen, uh, yeah, yeah, it's two carbons, six hydrogens, and one sulfur which I'm a complete idiot because I've drawn over the formula there, but that indeed was the requested. Uh, you have to rewind to see it, sorry. Um, so yeah, the complication there was that for H, when you burn it, you use up two hydrogen atoms to make one oxygen molecule. So because we're reversing the process, that's why it's multiplying by two there. Just a short video today. Thanks for listening, folks. Oh, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I've seen in the past, I have seen these in a number of disguises, um, for a variety of marks, uh, but they are relatively straightforward once you get the hang of these calculations, actually. It's literally just more calculations and dividing and playing with ratios. So thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.